Hello, welcome back to JW and Steve talk about Hema Longsword tournaments. Uh, we're going to start off talking about the major tournaments that happened this previous weekend, the third week of July, and that would be Queen's Gambit 2023 and Queen's Court 2023. So the major tournament that we're going to focus on today is Queen's Court, but let's just go over the top four uh, in both longsword categories for Queen's Gambit. So for the heavyweight, which is which was I believe a height category, so above five foot eight, I think. Yeah, five we nine and above. Yeah, five nine and above. Thank you. We have Benjamin Akrig in first, Lawrence Robinson in second, John Blood in third, and Matthew Maraglia in sorry for the pronunciation in fourth. So another thing to note about this tournament, it was kind of a pseudo single exchange so there were uh, many high value uh, options that could get you to the end of a match very quickly but it technically was was not a single exchange and they ran a uh, finals pool instead of a finals bracket so uh, that's why there's no bracket here yeah you, you can see there were four sets of pools basically where uh, a certain portion of the population was trimmed each time until you had a final set between the final four people, which I believe sorted them into their final order. Right. For lightweight steel, we have Cameron Metcalf in first, Paul Groover in second, Shane Meeks in third, and Wok Lu in fourth. So congratulations to all of the winners and finalists at Queen's Gambit 2023. So now we'll move on to the main event, Queen's Court 2023, which JW attended. I did. You won't see me in this uh, top eight, though. <laughs> so uh, Queen's Court had a more traditional, uh, I guess you would call modified Nordic, uh, two points for deep targets, one point for non, deductive afterblows. Uh, but was also interesting in that it had a five exchange rule set. Uh, but going down the finals of tier one, we had Brandon Ziplinger in first, uh, someone who probably hadn't been necessarily slotted to win, but uh, who had a lot of upsets throughout the day. Tanner Martin, who was, I think, the second highest rated person in the tournament, so definitely got as far as that was expected. Christopher Yang, a recent person who has moved from SoCal into the Ohio region, has been doing very well, followed by Ethan Adkins in fourth, who is another somewhat recent tournament fighter from the home club of Queen City. Sweet. Okay, so we have here Ben Hawk. He was the person who ran Queen's Court 2023, and we're going to ask him some questions about how it went. Ben, uh, did you have any goals going into this tournament that you wanted to talk about? Uh, so one of my big goals with this tournament is really testing out rule sets that reward good fencing, but are not punitive against bad fencing, if that makes sense. So more of the carrot, less of the stick. So that's kind of like why I chose that five pass system. So if you double a lot, you are welcome to waste your passes, right? Whereas it, you don't have a ton of time to do recon. You don't have a ton of time or options to make risky maneuvers. If you want to get ahead and you want to stay ahead, either you have to blitz early or you have to make sure you're holding onto that lead by not allowing secondary hits. So like stuff that would get people, you know, you, you, you avoid those doubles if you want to make sure you clearly win because you're pretty much always at risk unless you get an early lead. Mm-hmm. Uh, specifically with the five pass thing, it sounds like one of the intents was to make sure that people had just enough time to kind of adapt, but also rewarded people who had, uh, I guess, good openers in the first couple exchanges. Uh, was that, is that accurate? Uh, it's, it's close. It's also kind of trying to match that whole idea that if we were just, you know, if we were using sharps with just light gloves and your arms were exposed to a certain extent, you know, can't, do you re like, if we were to do this with sharps for real in history, would you necessarily get that opportunity to recon your opponent safely? Kind of like we do in a timed match. So, you know, how do you handle not really getting that opportunity to have that recon pass that recon fight? 
Sure. I think uh, we should go ahead and explain real quick what their rules actually were. Yeah, sure. Before we start talking more deeply about them. Sure. So the rules at Queen Court, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, was basically every exchange went to five passes. There was a two point one point spread where uh, two points for any cut or thrust to the head or chest, one point for any cut or thrust to the arm and legs, and um, a double, regardless of the outcome, would move the passes to the next pass. So, for example, if uh, we both hit each other in the head. We would both get two points. It was deductive after blows, so actually no one would get any points, but then we would move from the first exchange to the second exchange, essentially meaning uh, that you could kind of stall or uh, I guess an exchange could be non-conclusive and still continue. Right. You would only get However, five However, if there was a no exchange? Correct. No. So like something like a no exchange, so a ring out or a safety call does not make the pass continue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they, they, yeah. The, if the judges can't parse what happened, which I guess would be your no exchange, then you keep it on the same. Mm -hmm. right. Correct. So we're talking like a uh, kind of modified uh, Nordic rule set with the uh, two points and one point type thing uh, with that five pass system and uh, maybe a shorter lockout time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, do you feel the uh, the rule set achieved its goal? I think so, and the fact that the results were weird <laughs> compared to what we normally see in this area, I, I, I it definitely changed something. I don't know if it necessarily got the results I wanted, but I think it came close, and I think it uh, it's it shook up the shook up the stuff a little bit. Are there any sure. changes you would want to make for next time based on the results you got, or would it just be another go around? I'm tempted to go to the seven pass as kind of like a uh, crowd pleaser kind of a thing. Most people were like, hey, give me two more passes. I'd like this better. Um, at the end of the day, I don't 100% know if I'm going to do that again next year or bump up the passes. Um, it's more along the lines of, you know, are we starting to get away? Are we are we starting to rely more on that recon mm -hmm. early on? And I think that's, that's, that's kind of one of the things I find interesting about the five pass is recon's hard. Yeah. Right. So you're kind of, it seems like you're kind of compromise, like a compromise between um, like a normal match and maybe a single exchange match. So you don't want it over in a single exchange, but you still want people to not have a huge amount of time to, uh, you know, adapt and figure out what's going on before the match is over. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I was... Uh, I guess I would ask, um, is there anybody from the uh, Division Two tournament that you noticed, um, you know, did really well and you want to give a shout out to? I definitely want to give a shout out to Alec Willett. Uh, he ended up winning the tournament uh, for Division II. Uh He's got good speed. He's got good, got good targeting. Um, he's going to be a threat in the future, I think. He's still a young guy. Um, and uh, I'd also like to give a shout out to David Reddy. Uh, he got a, He got his first medal after a long time and a lot of hard work. Great. Nice. So watch out for them. Alec Willett and David Reddy. Well, I'd like to ask you, JW, you fought in the tournament. How did you feel about it? I, I mean, I am a very defensive fighter myself, and I was one of the people who contributed to the, the massive stint of upsets. Uh, but as I explained elsewhere, I, I think a lot of it came down to a lot of the people who were in the top you know, rankings going into the tournament had necessarily not kept up with their practice outside of, you know, uh, losing their club or something like that. At the exact same time, a lot of B-tier people who have recently been able to come up to A-tier thanks to performing well in beer, B-tier, are finding that they're actually not very far behind the rest of the A-tier people. So I, as much as the HEMA ratings would say that there was a lot of upsets, I actually kind of enjoyed the fact that a lot of uh, newer people to tier A got a chance to shine with a rule set that, you know, put them in the crucible and put them in a situation where their lack of previous knowledge of another person's style or fencing method uh, didn't really give them any disadvantage. I think that's good. Yeah, I, I, I like that. Um, I guess shout out to Ziplinger too. That's, that's, that's Ziplinger's first gold, I think, actually. So yeah, certainly. Definitely shout out. 
All right. Anything else? Cool. Well, thanks for joining us, Ben. Hey, yeah. no problem. Thanks for having me on. All right. So going into the bracket here, what we're primarily going to do is follow the path of the top four to see what kinds of fights they had to make it as far as they did. Uh, with Tanner Martin, who was the person who got second, we'll start with him simply because he was seated first after pools and had a bye. So there is no first fight to talk about. Uh, however, after that bye, he had to fight Colin McConnell, who was someone who had won previous tier Bs and had been recently bumped up to tier A and had done a very good job of defeating, uh, well, uh, AJ Trefney in an upset previously. Uh, but Tanner was able to win his match by a pretty decent margin. Though, again, with the five exchanges that we see, uh, there was not a lot of a time to adapt. So a lot of these matches came down to who could get those first few deep target clean hits and, you know, run away with the point score a little bit. Right. So Colin's match with AJ was a big upset, I would say. Um, their ratings, um, only about 150 apart. However, they had a, their, their head to head record. AJ is one three and Colin has one zero. So. Yeah. Uh, and the theme of upsets is going to be common when we're talking about this, because there were a lot of upsets in this bracket. Right. I would, I would imagine that the five exchange formats contributes a little bit to that because, Given only five exchanges, especially in the, uh, you know, one or two points scoring system, it seems like it, there would be maybe a higher volatility than you would see if in maybe a timed tournament. Would you agree with that? Or... Oh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Especially given that um, the uh, rules also emphasize timing and uh, tempo as meaning anytime you were basically pulling back one strike and following up with another one. So if both people went at each other and necessarily didn't hit each other within the same tempo, uh, it was very common for attacks that might have hit, you know, in terms of time, very close together, but were deemed, you know, not the same tempo, which meant that there was a huge emphasis to go very quickly and very accurately towards deep targets, because if you manage to land and your opponent had tried in any capacity to parry, their follow-up was going to be deemed out of tempo and you were going to get two points, which obviously with five exchanges, being one exchange down and uh, only four exchanges to go with a maximum of two points per exchange, that's a pretty difficult deficit to come back from. Right. Very harsh. Yes, I, I remember in uh, 2019, a lot of the long point league tournaments were also five exchanges and I remember it was pretty, uh, pretty unforgiving if you go down in the beginning. Yeah. So the next fight that happened was Tanner Martin versus Ethan Adkins. As I mentioned in the beginning, Ethan was seated pretty low in the previous fight, but was a hometown hero today, given that he had a lot of upsets himself coming from a relatively lowish standing, but having earned his way into tier A by uh, competing very well in tier B previously. Right. His two previous matches were very large upsets against uh, Frank Zamory and Aiden Witherspoon. Both of them, uh, both of their matches were equal head to head, but by HEMA rating, he was rated uh, very far below both of those, about 300 points. So um, a good showing for Ethan, for sure. Yeah, he definitely did a good job, especially... Um against uh, Frank and Aiden dealing with people who classically have very, very strong opening attacks. So he did not suffer the same problems that uh, other people might have with that being behind in the first exchange, uh, but ultimately wasn't able to get past Tanner Martin, um, likely due to uh, the, his ability to basically move backwards and parry hand strikes. Right. And they also had, Martin has a, uh, a two, two to zero head to head history against Atkins. So maybe some foreknowledge there helped him. Yeah. 
So the final match uh, that Tanner Martin was in, which he ultimately got second from, was uh, Tanner versus Brandon Ziplinger, which we mentioned earlier. Uh, it was a very close match, and at the time, uh, Brandon was seated more or less in the middle. He had come from uh, several upsets himself. He beat some people who had previously done very good in different tournaments and uh, had, the I think, one of the biggest upsets of the day, uh, given that, if I recall, Brandon Ziplinger had only really done a handful of tournaments before today. Have they uh, ever fought before, Martin and Ziplinger? No. So the only person that Ziplinger has has fenced uh, from his bracket run before today is Yang, and it was 1-0 for Yang. Okay. So he did very, very well for himself today, really proving he belongs in Tier A and coming away with the gold medal. I would say that... Martin was definitely the favorite to win this by humor rating and also by reputation. Mm -hmm. So uh, we already talked a bit about Ethan's run, uh, but real briefly, again, he defeated Frank Zamory in the first round of eliminations and then Ethan Witherspoon in the second round, only losing to Tanner Market Martin in the top four. But um, obviously, again, these were all massive upsets not only in HEMA rating, but also in seeding, with uh, Adkins being seeded below the top 10 going into the bracket and defeating two people who were seeded in the top five. After that, we can make a brief mention of the fact that your prediction did come true only uh, in the initial yeah. round of the brackets and not the finals. Uh, I lost to Aiden by a very close margin. And although I will say again, I, I did very poorly this tournament and uh, was seeded in the bottom 10, uh, which is something that hasn't happened to me in a while, but definitely uh, was something that happened that weekend. So we made predictions in our uh, test run uh, episode where we talked about Revolution Rumble. I predicted Witherspoon and Pugnetti for the final, and I believe you predicted Tanner and AJ for the final. Yeah. So you were half right. <laughs> Slightly more right, but yeah. yeah. So talking specifically about Brandon Ziblinger, the first place winner's uh, run, uh, he defeated John Osborne in a relatively expected outcome there with uh, Brandon, again, being uh, seated very high out of the pool as opposed to uh, some of the other people in the top four. And beating John Osborne, who was, I think, one of the uh, seated very, very low. Uh, somebody who I think ha used to be very, very strong in the Hema Longsword scene, but has taken a break since COVID. So uh, that's always one of the hard things, coming back from a several-year break to a TRA tournament where some people haven't been really training and other people have been training very hard. Thomas Kessler... The second match is this his tier a debut div one debut i think yes this is it's either his tier a debut or it's maybe the second time he's been in tier a but tom kessler is another person who up until recently has been doing very well in tier b and has worked his way up into tier a and seeded very well out of pools right his first match was against christopher shelton and that win was an upset for him, both by Hema rating and also because previously Shelton had had a 3-0 head-to-head -head record against him. So definitely beating a bracket team in there. Yeah. One thing to talk about last is just the sheer number of upsets that happened in this tournament. Um, I think you had made a spreadsheet and showed it to me, and it looked like of all the matches that happened in this uh, bracket, there were only four or five that were not considered upsets. Correct. Yeah. So in the first round, it was almost all upsets. There were only two two matches in the first round that were not upsets. Um, later on, there were more expected matches. There was one upset in the second round. And then, of course, as we mentioned before, the final match was an upset. So... I think that 
Well, one of the one of the things that 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 says to me is the possibly the volatility of the rule set, as as we mentioned before, because it is only five exchanges and a match can be decided in the first three, or you can get ahead and use uh, creative methods in order to keep your lead because you know that there's only a set you know, number of yeah. exchanges that are going to happen. And especially given that doubles would advance you know, the round, even if nobody got any points. So it was a, it was a relatively easy rule set to stall out, I guess you could say. Right. Uh, um, but well, another thing I think is worth talking about is at least, especially from my experience, a lot of the people who were highly rated going into this tournament have recently either stopped training or lost their clubs, or in some cases simply gone over to teaching rather than competing. So I think this was also an instance where a lot of the people who had been doing well in tier B's more or less by themselves uh, were significantly undervalued because they had been kind of kept from, you know, the top dogs, so to speak, in their tournaments. And now that they've been put into the top, you know, tier, they're finding that they're competing against people who are, you know, maybe on the downward trend of their game. So we, we see some rising stars really demonstrating that they deserve to be where they are fresh off of some wins in tier B where their HEMA rating maybe doesn't quite accurately reflect how much they've grown in the two years or so since COVID. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. And uh, those things will even out, right? So people will find, you know, where they belong. And uh, the people who are, are uh, you know, we're already in tier A will also adapt, right? So you know, it's, but it's great to see that, right? People advancing and, uh, and doing well for themselves in, in, uh, in the higher level. And it, it'll be interesting to see where it goes with that. And I don't want to, um, so I was talking about the rule set before. I don't want to take anything away from anybody who might've won because you still have to gain that lead, right? In order to, um, you know, in order to win. So at a certain point, you just, you have to outfence the other person and everybody who won, you know, outfence their opponent. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, no matter what kind of rule set at the end of the day, if you hit clean and you don't get hit, you will always win. Exactly. So this is going to be that final match between Tanner Martin and Brandon Zipper. So first exchange. Looks like a double hand number. hit there. It was ruled one point red, probably for the entry cut from Brandon. Second so exchange. Brandon going on the attack. Yeah. Brandon um, doing a very good job of throwing a lot of feints with his hand shots, making sure that all of Tanner's attempts to go for a parry are met with failure. Right. So Tanner's really searching for that parry and just not finding it. So now we're two exchanges in. Brandon's up 2-0. And again, five exchanges, so that's a pretty big deficit to come back from. Third exchange looks like another good hand shot from Brandon with an attempted counter thrust from Tanner that didn't quite make great contact. So now we're at 3-0, third exchange. Tanner really needs to uh, maybe change his strategy. Being defensive hasn't worked out so far. So maybe we'll see him go on the attack. Yeah, I mean, one of the most difficult things is that when your opponent knows that you have to go for deep targets, they can pretty much guarantee and expect what you're going to throw. And we saw that really play out that exact way. Tanner immediately went in expecting the hand shots and threw a big, strong thrust right to the center. Uh, bent his sword actually pretty visibly on that. Right. So the, the end result of that one was actually no exchange. Oh, so that's... That, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, <laughs> this one that we just watched was the fourth. And we saw Tanner enter with a uh, direct attack pretty much straight away. And Brandon counter with a kind of left side spare. Um, so we're seeing that aggression from Tanner. Yeah. So here's the final exchange, 3-1. Oh. Oh. A missed attack to the hands from Brandon resulting in a counter thrust from Tanner but it looks like he wasn't able to get that clean shot uh, which would give him the two points he needed to tie it up 
So I imagine that is again a one point given to Tanner, which means that it is a 3-2 match, which means that is how Brandon wins. Yeah, seeing the scorecard right over there, 3-1. Even if Tanner gets one point with a thrust to the chest and a hit to the hand, it will not be enough to win, and that will be the end of the match. Right. So, as expected, Tanner goes on the attack these uh, last few changes because he has to. Um, defense wasn't really working out for him in the beginning. Well, that's what I would do, too, is I would go on the attack. Um, but Brandon is able to cancel out the full two points with, with a hand attack. Um, which was really all he had left because it looked like he, you know, the thrust was really well timed. He wasn't able to get a parry off. Um, but, you know, any hit simultaneously will uh, disrupt Tanner's ability to gain the two points he needed in the last exchange. So, good tactical decision at the last second. Yeah. Uh, tactically, I mean, going into this, obviously. Parrying the hand shots was never working, and it just turned out that that was too much of a deficit to come back from. Three exchanges in a row where you go for a parry and you miss the parry and you get hit, regardless of whether or not you manage to try to get that counter thrust out, uh, means that it was a little bit just too much to come back from. And Brandon did a very good tactical job of making sure that every single exchange after those first three um, was met with some form of failure on the part of Tanner's aggression. Right. Overall, well fenced from Brandon. Um, good um, decision making from both sides, really. Um, Tanner's just, you know, his initial attempts just didn't really work out, and the adaptation just wasn't enough with the with the five exchange format. Yeah. Just over too quick. Yeah, one more exchange, and maybe we could have seen uh, those hand shots dealt with, or maybe another adaptation from Brandon on the part of uh, maybe going for slightly different targets other than the hands to try to make sure that uh, uh, Tanner could never get the points that he needed. But it was five exchanges, and at the end of them, Brandon was the winner, and Tanner was second place. We have Combat Con 2023 in Las Vegas, Nevada. So this is a major tournament that's been going on for quite a while. For the experienced steel division, we have a few recognizable names. Dashiell Harrison, he's coming off of a win from, I believe, Sword Squatch. I think this year, maybe last year. We have Jack Stewart uh, from UCSA. James Conlon from... Uh, Ohio will be competing. Jay Wu of the uh, Sword Inquisition in Massachusetts. He is, I believe, the the defending winner of of uh, Advanced Combat Con. So look out for him. We have Rochelle Debolt, who has been very dominant in women's tournaments and also has a recent open tournament win at Battleborn 3. So it'll be interesting to see how she places here of Noble Science Academy. We have, so this is a mostly US tournament, but we also see a little bit of representation from Canada and Mexico which makes this an international tournament. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they obviously have three categories, it looks like. They have uh, open steel, experienced steel, which we just went over, and an invitational, which I'm not sure if it's just not fleshed out yet or if it's not fully placed or if it's some other kind of bracket, I'm not sure. But for right now, this looks like where uh, all of the big name fencers have come from. And yeah, you get representation from all over the United States and a little bit from other countries. Right. And that will be this weekend of the 20th. And you can follow that on HEMA scorecard if you so desire. Mm -hmm. Want to make any predictions? <laughs> um, sure. There's a lot of names that I don't know here, so it's it's going to be hard to predict for sure. But I think um, I'm going to say I'm going to say Jay is going to be in the finals again. Mm hmm. 
that's going to be my only prediction. Um, as as defending uh, as the defending champion here, and somebody who I've known for a long time, we both have a background in kendo. Yeah. Um, well, that's my prediction. It'll be a good tournament to watch, and probably a good tournament to go to. All right. I guess we'll see you next time on JW and uh, Steve talk about longsword tournaments, I guess. <laughs>